Hey, everybody, this is Neil Sean from Journey, and may the rock be with you. Hey, Troy. How are you, Neil? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, man. Absolute pleasure to talk to you. Awesome. Man, welcome to May the Rock Be With You. Like I said, it's just a dream come true to talk to someone of your stature, man. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to talk to you. No worries at all. Now, we'll kick it off straight away because it has been over a decade, man, since the last album from Journey. Now, we finally have new music in the way of freedom. Why was now the right time for new music from Journey? Uh, well, you know what? I think there's never a wrong time. Uh, many, many did not want to get involved in making any new music because of the obvious state of the music industry. Hmm. Uh, you know, with all the streaming, uh, you know, nothing's really uh, been pulled together, I think, legally as it should have been years ago, since the beginning of Napster, you hmm. know, as far as streaming. You know, you uh, before that, Bands were pretty well taken care of if they had a decent contract with a label uh, and making money off their new music uh, because, you know, frankly, you it costs money to make a good record. You know, it's not cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people just do it in their bedroom now. It's not a rock and roll thing to do. It does not work with rock and roll, a drum machine and, you know, keyboard bass and keyboards and a vocal, slap a vocal on there. I mean, there's many other genres that can make albums like that. But to me, that's not a rock and roll force. It does not work. And the fidelity is not there. Uh, and so, you know, there there was many reasons that nobody wanted to get involved in it. You know, having said that, 11 years go by. Uh, COVID hits. We never planned on sitting at home for two years and not being able to tour. I mean, at least we could tour before. Even if you're not making new music, you, you know, rewrite your older songs and you redo your sets and, you know, mm. make it interesting for your audience. And um, uh, frankly, you know, I, I just I had to turn to writing a bunch of new music because, you know, you're stuck in a house uh, in order to stay safe and uh, not allowed to go outside and work. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we went through a lot in those two years. Um uh, we got through the lawsuit with the ex band members at this point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at that point, when I got the green light, we won in court. I was like, it's time for me to get busy. I want to write a new record. There's, there's a, a new chapter in Journey coming here. You know, this will be my 50th uh, anniversary next year uh -huh. uh, with Journey and the only original and the original founding member. And so, you know, I feel like it's 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 almost... It's it's a love that I have for the band, but it's a duty I also have to our audience to keep things moving forward and not sitting in neutral. And and yes, we have zillions of hits. We can yank from any one of those platinum albums uh, and redo our set, keep on redoing it with the older hits. But I, I felt like it's it's time to grow into a new era and, um, you know, a new chapter for Journey. And so that's why I chose an artist, Michael Walden on drums and as a producer, co-producer with myself and Randy Jackson, as I've known these guys for many years, played with them all the way back in the beginning of Journey, pre-Steve Perry. You know, I met Narda when he uh, uh, was uh, took over for Billy Cobham with uh, Ma Vishnu Orchestra. And Journey opened up for Ma Vishnu, you know, while Narda was in the band. And this is before I knew he was even a producer, you know, as qualified as he is. And I knew he was a brilliant drummer and jammed with him for years. But after I worked with him on a solo project, you know, I did Universe mm -hmm. with him. It was released uh, a few years back and I had a great time with him and never realized truly how talented he was in producing as well as writing and playing other instruments as well as playing drums. And it was a really easy experience for me and I really enjoyed it. So I thought, what better way to get off to a new start for Journey and, and working on a new project is to work with somebody that's very upbeat like himself. And um, I had a, a phenomenal time with him working on this record. And, you know, it was very off the cuff. Uh, there was no pressure. I walked in every day and said, what do you want to do today? And he was like, what do you feel like doing? And I said, 
uh, you don't want to work on what we worked on yesterday. And he goes, no, nah, let's just move forward. So we just <laughs> kept the ball rolling, you know, and we kept yeah. uh, trying a lot of different types of music. And we stumbled upon, you know, like this heavier rocking funk that we have on this album that's never been on any of our other records. And, mm. you know, kind of chased that for a bit at the last moment. And, um, you know, I really was uh, conscious of that because this is the first album in 11 years and because the 50th is coming up for me, I wanted to encompass everything that I'd experienced musically with Journey from the very get-go to where we are now, you know, and where I am. And so I think that we managed to do that very well. I mean, it's a longer record. It's 15 songs mm. and actually 16 in Japan. But, um, you know, it's a very diverse album. I think is diverse. And as good as an escape or uh, frontiers, but also has the musicality and the orchestral vibe of infinity, you know, going back to infinity and some of the jams that are in it even go back further than that to our earlier records. So I felt like I encompassed everything and was really conscious of that as we were moving forward and writing the album that you know i didn't want to leave any of those decades out yeah nice and you talk about that because the balance is and always been there for journey you between the big rockers the massive ballads which do you find easier or prefer to write well you know what um it's funny um when steve perry was in the band i found it way easier to do ballads uh, than the rock and roll because I would bring in all the rock and some of it a lot of it just never made it because it didn't mesh you know with his style and and then we found the niche of doing you know like uh, separate ways and songs like that that had more of a Motown feel because Steve was like a soul singer you know uh, uh, brought up with you know on a lot of great soul singers you know and um, it was it was a fine edge to follow because I was a big fan of Jimmy Barnes and you know you know his first band from Australia um, and everything he did after that and I liked that harder edge and we were never never quite able to do that even though I was capable of playing that and and writing it it just didn't fit with with, with Steve style and so Arnell, in his own right, he's he's pretty much of a freaking ch chameleon. You know, when I found him on uh, YouTube 15 years ago, uh, the Journey tunes that he covered were the last tunes that I actually listened to. I listened to all the other, you know, 38 clips that were there of him doing Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and, and, and just everybody. He's like, you know, doing everyone. And I went, wow, this guy, he can croon with the best of them. When I heard Faithfully in Open Arms, I was like, this guy is insane. I go, he's he's our singer. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew immediately that he was the guy and, you know, was met with a lot of resistance from management at the time and, and others in the band. They thought I was crazy. Yeah. They go, where's he from? And, I, you know, and I'm, is he from LA or New York? And I'm like, he's in Manila. Everybody was like, <laughs> You're insane because he even <laughs> speak English, you know? And I said, who cares if he speaks English? He he sings in English, fine. We can teach him. Yep. <laughs> and so I said, get him over here. And so they did. And um, the rest is history. But, you know, on this album, I think Arnell and, and I had a lot of fun with it, uh, going in some different directions that weren't necessarily in the vein of what we already have, mm. you know? There's familiar sounding stuff too, because I don't think you can completely abandon all that. And a lot of the melodies were, you know, melodies that we all wrote, you know. I mean, if I sat down with Steve in the old days and I kind of, you know, banged out some chords to him and I hummed a melody, he goes, oh, I like that. And then he would change it up and, you know, it was kind of like you throw the ball around and hmm. um, it would transform into what comes out to be a chemistry amongst yourself uh, as writers, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, the one thing I've always loved about Journey, and I mean, I've got a don't stop believe in tattoo. You know what I mean? You just have to do that because that's what you do. 
The band has always been uplifting and delivering messages of hope and positivity. Has this always been a conscious decision when writing? Um, yes, it has. You know, I mean, it's just always where Steve came from before uh, John came into the band and Greg left. But even when Greg wrote, it was the same thing. Uh, when Steve and I wrote, it was the same thing. And so we we never chose to get political, you know, mm. we didn't want to get, you know, pulling the politics and all that. I mean, you know, it makes for a good angry rock song, but yeah. we just weren't an angry band, you know? And we kind of, I think that it was to our benefit to stick to our guns and, and you know, even though critics went at us and said, oh, this is just soft schmaltz or whatever, you know, at, at some point in our career, and they also were very pissed off that they couldn't pigeonhole us as being one element in rock, like soft rock or hard rock or in between. We were kind of like all over the place mm. and we were covering a lot of ground, you know, uh, creatively and musically and very diverse for any band, I think. Uh, so yeah. when people used to compare us to other bands that came out in the same era as us, I was like, well, Commercially successful, yes, mm -hmm. but I don't think we sound like any of them. You know, if you listen to all the material, if you listen to a mother, father, and then you listen to, you know, open arms, or you listen to a stone in love, or you listen to, you know, any uh, dead or alive. I mean, it's got like, you know, punk vibes written all over it. It, it just, you know, we were kind of dabbling in everything that we felt like, you know, or R and B. You know, I'll be all right without you. Yep. Um, there's almost, I found with this band, um, and and I think more so now, even with our existing rhythm section that we have now, because things didn't really work out with Narda on tour or Randy, you know, I mean, just there was physical things going on with, with both guys and, mm. and uh, kept them from touring with us. So, you know, with Dean Casanova back in the band, who's been my brother forever, you know, and he's just solid as rock, mm -hmm. sings his ass off, plays his ass off, nothing that he doesn't remember. You know, I mean, he never forgets anything. You know, <laughs> yeah. I can go back to him and go, Dean, how does my song go back from that era? You know, go, oh, it just goes like this, man. <laughs> and, it'll, you know, he's got it all upstairs and it's like, you know, photogenic memory. And, you know, we brought... Todd Jensen back into the fold because Dean and Todd and I really clicked and all the projects that we worked on, you know, whether it was Hardline or it was, you know, Paul Rogers, you know, I put that trio together with Paul singing in front and it was a phenomenal band. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was really some of the best stuff I've ever played and having Paul sing and it was just, you know, I hated to even see it go away. Yep. Yeah, because I got to tap into my blues roots and the heavier rock stuff. And we, you know, we covered everything when I was working with Paul, with Dean and Todd. We covered everything from Free to Bad Company to The Firm to Muddy Waters Blues album that everybody had played on, Jeff Beck and all these great guitars uh, to Jimi Hendrix. Then I started after we learned all the catalog. Then I started throwing some Hendrix tunes at him. And, you know, to play five or six Hendrix tunes a night with, with all that other, you know, uh, material was just phenomenal. We had like a two-hour show that was just rapid fire, loaded and, you know, killer, killer stuff. So I knew what Dean and Todd and they were capable of. And now our audience has seen it this last year. And all the naysayers that were out there, are, you know, the trolls, that they go on the journey site and say, oh, you know, there's no journey without this person or this person or this person. They've all gone away because <laughs> everybody that saw the tour that have seen every different version of journey with all the different people that have been in a band, they go, honest, Scott, I think this is the best version I've ever seen or heard. Wow. Even Pat, Pat Thrall is a good friend of mine, a guitarist, you know, from Automatic Man and you know, he's a well-known guitarist, an excellent guitarist. He came to see us recently in Las Vegas. And he, he I, I spoke to him after the show. 
And he says, wow. He goes, that is absolutely the freaking best I've ever seen you. Wow. And he says, I've seen every incarnation from the very get-go. He says, you guys have gone to another level. And, you know, we've got the right in-front house mixer now, too, that just pulled it all together to where it sounds like a pre-mixed album like it should have been for years now. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have fine-tuned gear. We're fine-tuned musicians. We have our own dynamics. And we had a lot of guys that were like fader happy, you know, couldn't get yeah. your hands off the faders. It's like, get it sounding right and just leave it there. Yep. You want to chase vocals, you know, boost the guitar solos, maybe a dB or dB and a half, mm -hmm. but leave it alone, you know, just leave it alone. And it sounds like a mixed record every night. So we got that guy now and I've not seen one funky review from anyone. Amazing. Know? It's yeah. outstanding. Like, now, I have to ask again, because with songs such as Don't Stop Believing that took over the world again after The Sopranos, and in Glee, now with separate ways on Stranger Things, more and more people are being introduced to Journey. Now, how does it feel after so long together to still have momentum and now multi-generational success thanks to your music now being shared in new ways? It's just amazing, man. It's such a blessing, you know? Great question. But, you know, I, I look out and really this year when we played Lollapalooza, and we started out in the East Coast, and they were our first shows ever. While well, Narda was still in the band, and I had pulled Dean in at that time to help out too mm -hmm. in remembering stuff because it was a lot for anybody to digest that really didn't know all, all of our catalogs, you know. Um, we played, and I recall looking out in the front of the first 10 rows, as far as I could see, and they were all young teenagers, wow. you know. They were young kids and they were so in it, you know, um, Post Malone was on the bigger stage. They went on stage, I think, 10 minutes after us or 10 minutes before us. And they put us on a smaller stage. But I think it was kind of like a, a political mob move. They didn't want us to feel like we were that big still. And I'm going, hey, you know what, Chicago, we've owned Chicago since, you know, the late 70s. I mean, you know, we'd open up for the Stones and Soldiers uh, Field and get three encores in front of them. And it only got bigger and bigger after that. So I had another feeling that it was going to happen. And within really the first 10 minutes, everybody I believed that was on the other side of the field came to our side and I couldn't see the end of people. It was like 115, 120,000 people. Wow. And we our, our night sold out first out of all the shows and I had a feeling they were journey people. And so when we played our hits, somebody we filmed from the back of the stage from an iPhone and um, the clip is floating around on the internet because I had put it up, but they are so loud. The audience is so loud and they're in back of the band where usually you can only hear the drums and all the amps are in front of that. So you don't yep. hear much of it and you don't hear the PA. The audience is singing so loud you can't even hear the band. Wow. You know, it reminded me of the Beatles and Candlestick Park. You know, mm. it was crazy. Just, you know, like nothing I ever imagined would be happening in this day and age. And so this last year was so gratifying to me uh, to see the acceptance of five generations of, of, of you know, our audience. And, and really, I'm seeing five generations now. It was four. Now it's five, and it keeps getting younger every year. Yeah, I just thought it was amazing. I heard that version of uh, Separate Ways, and I went, oh, this is going to take off. <laughs> like, this is going to be great. But... Yeah, it's wild. And, you know, I think that the fact that that we keep the band relevant, yeah, you know, because we play constantly, and we're selling out arenas now. You know, I got away from Live Nation. We're, back, we're with AEG, mm -hmm. and they took a gamble on us while they were being told you're going to lose your ass this and that you know a couple guys in aeg and, uh, and my new agent and uh, jeff frasco and jay marciano had, he, they believed in me and i said just put us back in arenas and you're going to see and they were a little worried i think at first but then after i think halfway through the first week we sold out every show yep. and i think we would have sold out regardless 
of who we brought on with us because we just got done playing in the East Coast. We played some one-offs with independent promoters uh, just closing out the second leg. And we we sold out like on a Monday night with nobody else on the bill, you know? So good. So, the band is stronger than ever. That's all I know. Yeah. Well, on touring, I have to ask, you made it to Australia for the first time back in 2013. Is there any chance you might be coming back one day soon? I'm hoping to come over next year. I mean, that is the plan. You know, we plan to play um, the first 40 shows in the United States, like we started out this year, like in February. Mm -hmm. uh, get out early, do that, head over to Europe, uh, possibly to Australia, that's what we're talking about, and to South America. You know, we haven't been to South America in a long time, too. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have huge audiences all over the world. But I think because of where management was back then that we no longer have and where Live Nation was, they want you to go where they're going to be like in control. And they don't have to, you know, they don't have to share with other independent promoters that are stronger across the world. Mm. You know, I mean, yes, there's Live Nation, there's AEG all over the world, but you have a lot of politics involved. And so, you know, being at the right page that I'm at now, I've been really paying attention, you know, uh, for quite some time now and learned from the best. And, you know, I've been managing myself, you know, mm. and uh, just taking a bull by the horns and cutting out all the excess that doesn't need to be there. And we're doing quite well, you know. Awesome. Well, we look forward to hopefully seeing you. Now, you said you've been in the band 50 years, which just blows my mind. Since you've started, is there still one thing that you'd love to do that you haven't yet been able to do? Well, I think that we're we're nearly there. And um, I mean, you know, really next year is our 50th, but we're not going to quite do what I saw doing on our 50th. So I think we're just going to keep on celebrating a 50th for a few years. <laughs> and the 51st, first you say, you know, let it go on. But I, I feel like uh, we've done it already very successfully. And I even dabbled in it myself before we got going with this latest version of Journey, uh, as I did some dates uh, and called it Neil Sean's Journey Through Time. Mm. And um, I had Dean Castronova, I had Greg Raleigh, uh, I had Marco Mendoza, and I had John Vaughn on keyboards covering everything. And we went, we we started out playing a little tiny club in San Francisco, uh, did a benefit for the Fireman's Fund in San Francisco because of all the fires, that were going on in the Bay Area at that time. And I just thought, you know, I really want to test this out on the audience. I want to go back to our first album. I want to play like a lifetime. And then I want to jump to, a, you know, a greatest hit song. Then I want to go back to our second album, play Look Into the Future, and then play another hit. Then go back and play an instrumental off the next, you know, nickel and dime or something. Then go play another hit, mm. you know. And it worked tremendously. The audience was completely blown away. We did one show in San Francisco. We did one in Oakland, sold out the theater. Then we went down to LA and sold out the theater in LA. And that was by far the best show that I wish I would have had on film. Oh, because wow. I swear to God, we took it so outside. Um, I decided I was going to get really daring. And, you know, we played a song like La Du Da Du Day. That's a mm. shuffle. And... I put like a Miles Davis, uh, Jack Johnson bass part in the end. And then I tripped it out. I said, I'm going to take this more outside than I've ever played on guitar in front of any audience. Only what I would do maybe in my own studio, just, you know, messing around. Hmm. Uh, and if it goes over their head, I'm going to understand that they <laughs> can't comprehend, you know, and it's too far. Instead, I got standing ovation. You know, after playing a 15 minute guitar solo, that's completely abstract and off the wall, but very energetic. And so I realized at that point that we could do anything. We could, we could do what Fish is doing. We could do what the Grateful Dead is doing. That's what I see myself doing, you know, with Journey. Um, you know, I don't know if it's this formation, but that's what I want to end up doing because there's a bigger audience out there yet than what we even have. And I've gone to see, you know, I saw the dead as a kid, never quite 
completely understood it. You yeah. know, music because my head was somewhere else. But I saw Santana play with them in the same night that I went as a kid before I even knew them or joined them, mm. you know, as a guitarist with Carlos. And I thought, well, Santana, they're jamming too. But, you know, there's there's it's a little more honed in, you know, and it's more based off of rhythm that nobody can deny. You know, once that locomotive gets going with congas and drums and timbales, I mean, you cannot deny, you know, when that thing gets going, that there's no stopping it. And there's no following it either. You know, so, you know, I've learned a lot through the years watching. And, you know, Journey started out as one of those jam bands from San Francisco. And we were known as, you know, San Francisco's favorite, you know, jam band delight. We were like, the, you know, the dead on steroids when yeah. we first started. And we used to play and just kill everybody that we played with, you know, especially in San Francisco. And so, you know, it's fun to, it was fun for me to go back and experience that again and then have all the future lying ahead of like what we just created with, with the new album, you mm. know, uh, Freedom. And uh, there's a lot of things left to do, I feel, you know. I feel very creative and very energetic about it all and, and how our audience has grown. And what I'm noticing is the young audience is is more willing than even our old audience that are more prone to be just great as hit. Mm. They're not so willing to have anything laid on the young audience. They never got to see the greatest bands of all time. I consider the greatest bands that I saw when I was a kid. Jimmy wow. Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, wow. you know, Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart, and who? And then the faces. I love seeing the faces with Rod Stewart and Ron Wood. You know, that was my favorite bar- party band, and the who were my favorite party band, too. You know? Yep. And, you know, I-, I saw everything. I saw Aretha Franklin. Wow. You know, it was either R&B, you know, or Funk, Sly, and Family Stone or electric blues from, you know, the UK. And that was the greatest stuff ever. And so what I'm saying is that I'm noticing that the young audience that we have now, when we want to lay heavier stuff on them, they they just eat it up. They love it because they missed, they can watch videos, but they don't see anybody live doing it anymore. And we're one of the bands that are capable of doing it. That's awesome. Now, lastly, let's look ahead to the future with a prediction. I want you to finish this sentence for me. By the end of 2022, Journey will <laughs> uh, have played to about 400,000 people <laughs> this year, um, put out their best album to date <laughs> <laughs> that can equally, you know, compete with some of the greatest albums that have Diamond Awards now, you know, our greatest hits. Uh, Escape has a Diamond Award. And Frontiers is heading towards a Diamond Award right now. Wow. And so, and everybody's compared this new album to those albums. And I think that they're correct. I, I, I think it's a very strong album uh, uh, musically and showing, you know, the ability to move forward and to, to head into some new powerful directions, uh, like, like songs like uh, Holding On, Okay, um, all day and all night. It's really kind of funky, more like Eurythmics and you know, Bad Company. You know, mixed with Journey. Um, you know, we have uh, Let It Rain. That's mm-hmm. more like my Cajun soup of Hendrix and Prince and Sly Stone stuck in one. You know, uh, and and you know, we've got we're adding that stuff to the set. And it's really rounding out our show really well because, you know, you're coming with the off the wall, a little more obscure, um, you know, stuff that you improvise from night to night. It's not exactly the same every night is what I'm saying. Some songs are meant to be pretty close to play to, to exactly like the record, like a song like Lights or Faithfully or Separate Ways. You know, I mean, with with what you were saying you know, about Separate Ways coming out now in the new version there's many things that i can see happening even to that live to make it more interesting you, know, you can start a show with arnell doing the acapella with 
a whole orchestral thing going on and then even take it a step further make it more outside and then have it go into the real you know the album version but you know uh there's so much left to do and i think we're we've done a lot this year and um we've got uh another leg coming up here i just got home two days ago and finished up the second leg of the tour and um we're, we're gonna be playing in puerto rico and we're playing in mexico and we're playing in hawaii and um to 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 finish out the year and so um a lot accomplished this year feel very good about it excellent Neil, thank you so much for your time, man. What an honor to speak to you. Like I said, I love your band. You're one of my favorites. It's just, this is a dream come true. Well, hopefully we'll get to come over next year, like I said. And hopefully I'll I'll get to meet you in person. You know, Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure, man. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a Thanks, great Neil. one. See you, mate.